Good evening and welcome to the second annual Keenan Distinguished Lecture. My name is Elizabeth Keish. I'm the director of the Keenan Ethics Program. And I know that I'm joined by President Nan Cohan, who is chair of the Keenan Ethics Program Advisory Board, and by all the members of the program's advisory board and steering committee and staff in welcoming all of you this evening. We're particularly delighted to welcome members of the Keenan family, whose generosity made the Keenan Ethics Program and this lectureship possible. We're joined tonight by Betty Keenan, who is chair of the Keenan Fund for Ethics, as well as by Tom Owen and Sterling Keenan, and we welcome all of you, and we're really glad you're here. It's also an honor to have in the audience tonight one of North Carolina's most distinguished educational leaders, Bill Friday, who presided over the University of North Carolina and now serves as the director of the William R. Keenan Charitable Trust, and we welcome him and his wife, Ida. And it's especially fitting that we hold this lecture tonight in the Terry Sanford Institute of Public Policy, which celebrated its 25th anniversary this past weekend, and which is the namesake of another of our state's shining civic and educational leaders and innovators. And finally, it's a tribute to our speaker tonight that this lecture is included in not one, but two week-long series of events at Duke. The first is the first annual Ethics and Integrity Week sponsored by the Honor Council, while the second is a week devoted to a dialogue on race, which has been organized to coincide with the 30th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and organized in part in response to an invitation from President Clinton's Commission on Race, a commission, as you know, which is chaired by Duke Professor Emeritus John Hope Franklin. I welcome all of you who are here uh, as participants in those, in those two weeks, and I invite all of the rest of you to attend the other wonderful lectures, seminars, and, pre and performances which are scheduled for later in the week. The aim of the Keenan Lectureship is to bring to Duke distinguished speakers who will address ethical issues of broad social and cultural significance. Few, very few scholars fit this description as perfectly as does our speaker tonight. Professor Robert Bella, Elliott Professor of so Sociology Emeritus at the University of California at Berkeley, has the rare distinction among scholars of having inspired and incited arguments and counter arguments in over half a dozen disciplines, including sociology, political science, philosophy, religion, anthropology, literature, and public policy, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. He began his career, I, I learned just tonight, as a specialist on Japanese religion, and his first book was entitled Tokugawa Religion. He then went on to author many books on the sociology of religion, including The New Religious Consciousness, Varieties of Civil Religion, and Uncivil Religion, Interreligious Hostility in America. But he is best known for two books he wrote with an interdisciplinary group of colleagues, Habits of the Heart, Individualism and Commitment in American Life, which was published in 1985 and then in an updated edition in 1996, and The Good Society, published in 1991. These books have reached far beyond the academy, helping to frame the terms of public debate about individualism and social commitment, as well as about the role of religious and other cultural institutions in the formation of public values. They exemplify what the authors themselves call social science as public philosophy, an effort to hold a rigorous mirror up to American society and to force us to think about who we are as Americans and how we ought to live. The picture in the mirror is in many respects deeply troubling. Professor Bella minces no words in describing the injustice and the lack of generosity toward our fellow citizens which blights American society today. And yet, Professor Bella and his co-authors are not content to rest simply with gloomy diagnosis. Instead, he offers arguments for ways to transform American society and his solutions, as Harry Boyd has, offer, has argued recently in his book, Building America, are always based in an argument and a belief 
about people's moral interconnectedness. Boyd credits Bella's work with helping to inspire new strategies for civic education, including quite specific new initiatives like the community service movement in K through 12 education. It is these themes of our moral failures as well as our moral possibilities that Professor Bella will be addressing tonight. His topic is, is there a common American culture, diversity, identity, morality? And we look forward very much to what he has to say. Join me in welcoming Professor Robert Bell. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, to see some old friends that go far back in my life, and a lot of other people that I've met only after coming but who share many of my deepest concerns. So it's a real pleasure to be involved in this lectureship and to be part of your activities this week. Um, unfortunately, I'm a bit tall, so the podium here isn't quite structured for me, but I'll do the best I can. My talk this evening is a revised and expanded version of a talk I gave at the AAR meeting last fall, and the title, Is There a Common American Culture?, was given to me by the convener of that session. I began my talk by asking the question, not whether there is a common American culture, but rather how is it that a plenary session of the American Academy of Religion is devoted to this question in a society with so powerful and monolithic a common culture as ours? The answer, I said, is obvious. It has become part of the common culture to ask whether there is a common culture in America. Kay Anthony Appiah, professor of Afro-American studies and philosophy at Harvard, in a review of Nathan Glazer's recent book, We Are All Multiculturalists Now, whose very title makes the point, quotes the book as saying, the Nexus database of major newspapers shows no reference to multiculturalism as late as 1988. A mere 33 items in 1989, and only after that a rapid rise. More than 100 items in 1990, more than 691, more than 992, 1,293, 1,594. Appia adds, when it comes to diversity, it seems we all march to the beat of a single drummer. There is something very congenial to multiculturalism in common American culture. But such congeniality is not to be assumed as natural or shared in all societies today. It is worth looking at the contrast case of France. Rodney Benson, a graduate student in my department at Berkeley, is writing a most interesting dissertation which, among other things, compares the fate of multiculturalism in France and the US. Benson describes a nascent French multiculturalist movement in the late 70s and early 80s which was ultimately rejected by the entire ideological spectrum from right to left in favor of a universalistic republicanism by the late 1980s. Just when multiculturalism in the US was taking off, France was deciding this was not for them. Why American culture has been so singularly receptive to multiculturalism as an ideology is a point to which I will return. But first, a sociological point about why there not only is but has to be a common culture in America. Culture does not float free from institutions. A powerful institutional order will carry a powerful common culture. An example of just how important this relation between culture and institutions is comes from the recent reunification of Germany. In the last days of the German Democratic Republic, the protesters chanted, Wir sind ein Volk and the chant stirred euphoria among West Germans as well. But the painful and unexpected experience of living together was made vivid to me by an outstanding Harvard doctoral dissertation filed last year by Andreas Glaser using the integration of East and West German police officers in a uh, unified police force in Berlin as a microcosm showed that they were not, after all, ein Volk, but indeed zwei. It wasn't just that the Aussies and the Wessies, the Easterners and the Westerners, as they're called in Germany, 
had different views on common problems. They had different and to some degree mutually unintelligible ways of thinking about the world altogether. 45 years of radically different institutional orders had created two cultures, which to this day are very far from united, although the experience of a unified institutional order will almost certainly, though not without time and pain, ultimately reunite them. Here I make the point, genes are not culture. Language is not culture. The United States surely has an exceptionally powerful institutional order. The state in America, even though it is a multi-leveled and to a degree decentralized state, has an enormous impact on all our lives. For example, the shift in marriage law in the late 60s and early 70s toward what was called a no-fault divorce pattern was a response to, but also an impetus for, the emergence of a divorce culture could talk about this at length, because I had another marvelous dissertation on this subject not too long ago at Berkeley. But it really did emerge at a particular time and place, and very much under state impetus, as a serious competitor to marriage culture. It's not that marriage culture is gone in America, but it is in a different position than it would have been 30 years ago. The state is even responsible to a degree for the construction of multiculturalism through the little boxes that must be checked on a myriad of forms. Haven't you ever been tempted to check them all or leave them all empty? I just got my latest um, Harvard Health questionnaire, uh, which is sent to me every five years because I'm class of 48. There are the boxes. Don't they know who I am? They have to ask me to check the boxes at this point? Anyway. If the state intrudes in our lives in a thousand ways, the market is even more intrusive. There is very little that Americans need that we can produce for ourselves anymore. We are dependent on the market not only for goods, but for many kinds of service. Our cultural understanding of the world is shaped every time we enter a supermarket or a mall. I taught a senior seminar of about 20 students last spring, my last teaching semester at Berkeley roughly divided into about one-fourth Asian American, one-fourth Hispanic, one-fourth African American, one-fourth uh, Anglo. What was remarkable was how easily they talked because of how much they shared. Beyond the ever-present state and market, they shared the immediate experience of coping with a vast state university with its demands and its incoherence. Education, which is linked largely, though not exclusively, to the state, and television and increasingly the internet linked to the market are enormously powerful purveyors of common culture, socializers not of, of children only, but of all of us, most of our lives. Not only are we exposed from infancy to a monoculture, we are exposed to it monolingually. The cultural power of American English is overwhelming, and no language except under the most unusual circumstances has ever been able to withstand it which is what makes the English-only movement such a joke. As Appiah notes, 90% of California-born Hispanic children of immigrant parents have native fluency in English, and in the next generation, only 50% of them still speak Spanish. One more generation and you can forget about Spanish. It's gone. When third-generation Asian Americans come to college in California, they have to learn Chinese or Japanese in language classes just like anyone else. They don't bring those languages with them. Apia contrasts our society with his own experience growing up in Ghana, where there were three languages spoken in his household, English, Tswi, and Navrongo. Ghana, he writes, with a population smaller than that of New York State, has several dozen languages in active daily use, and no one language that is spoken at home or even fluently understood by a majority of the population. Ghana is multilingual and therefore multicultural in a way that we, except for first-generation immigrants, have never been. When language, which is the heart of culture, goes, then so, in any deep sense, often does cultural difference. I don't say identity, which is something I will come back to, but culture. Serious multicultural education would begin by teaching native English speakers a second language, early, the way the Europeans learn it. But that, unlike most of the rest of the world, almost never happens in the United States. 
The half-hearted effort to teach Spanish in California public schools results in very few native English speakers with a secondary fluency in Spanish. <clears throat> Why don't most Americans speak another language? Because we don't have to. Everyone in the world speaks English, or so we think. So much for multiculturalism. There are exceptions, though they are statistically small, but I'd better talk about them. Enclaves of genuine cultural difference centered on a language different from English can persist or even emerge under special conditions where socioeconomic status is low and residential segregation is effective. A particularly poignant example is the emergence among one of the oldest groups of English speakers in America, African Americans, of enclaves of black English dialects in a few inner cities in the northeastern US that have become mutually unintelligible with standard American English. This can happen under conditions of hypersegregation where opportunities to participate in a larger society are almost completely denied. Native American languages survive on a few reservations, though many are dying out every year. Several Indian languages are dying out, even with strenuous efforts to maintain them. Since there is much less hypersegregation of Hispanics or Asians than of blacks, enclaves of Spanish or Korean or other Asian languages have the generational transience of, say, Polish or Italian 100 years ago. If I am right, there is an enormously powerful common culture in America, and it is carried predominantly by the market and the state and by their agencies of socialization, television, and education. What institutions might withstand that pressure and sustain genuine cultural difference? In simpler societies, kinship and religious communities might do so. But in our society, families and churches or synagogues are too colonized by the market and the state to provide much of a buffer. They may give a nuance, nuance and inflection to the common culture, but families and even religious communities are almost always too fragile to provide a radical alternative. Nevertheless, I don't want to underestimate this. Nuances and inflections are important, not only in their own right, but because they can provide the wedge through which criticism of the common culture and the possibility of altering it can occur. What then is the content of this common culture? If we realize that the market and the state in America are not and have never been antithetical, and that the state has had the primary function for conservatives and liberals alike of maximizing market opportunities, I believe I can safely borrow terminology from habits of the heart and say that a dominant element in the common culture is what we called utilitarian individualism. In terms of historical roots, this orientation can be traced to a powerful Anglo-American utilitarian tradition going back at least as far as Hobbes and Locke, although it operates today quite autonomously without any necessary reference to intellectual history. Utilitarian individualism has always been moderated by what we called in habits expressive individualism, which has its roots in Anglo-American romanticism, but which was, has picked up many influences along the way from European ethnic, African-American, Hispanic, and Asian influences. Here, too, the bland presentism of contemporary American culture obliterates its own history. Our Anglo students do not come to college with a deep knowledge of Jane Austen or Nathaniel Hawthorne or Anthony Trollope any more than our Japanese-American students bring a knowledge of Lady Murasaki or Natsume Soseki. What they bring, they bring in common. Oprah Winfrey, ER, Seinfeld, Nike, Microsoft, the NBA, and the NFL. If the common culture is predominantly Euro-American or more accurately Anglo-American in its roots, the enormous pressure of the market economy and the mass media and mass education oriented to it obliterate the genuine heritage of Anglo-American, European, African, and Asian culture with equal thoroughness. And yet, and yet, nestled in the very core of utilitarian and expressive individualism is something very deep, very genuine, very old, very American, something we did not quite see or say in habits. And the core of that something is religious. In Habits, we quoted a famous passage in Tocqueville, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, 
where he writes, I think I can see the whole destiny of America contained in the first Puritan who landed on those shores. Then we went on to name John Winthrop following Tocqueville's own predilection as the likeliest candidate for being that first Puritan. Now I am ready to admit, though regretfully, that we and Tocqueville were probably wrong. That first Puritan who contained our whole destiny might have been, as we also have intimated in Habits and Hutchinson, but the strongest candidate, because we know so much more about him, is Roger Williams. Roger Williams, banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony by John Winthrop, founder of Providence and of the Rhode Island Colony, was, as everyone knows, a Baptist. The Baptists in 17th century New England were a distinct minority, but they went on to become, together with other sectarian Protestants, a majority in American religious culture from the early 19th century. As Seymour Martin Lipset has recently pointed out, we are the only North Atlantic society whose predominant religious tradition is sectarian rather than that of an established church. I think this is something enormously important about our culture and that it has, believe it or not, a great deal to do with why our society is so hospitable to the ideology, if not the reality, of multiculturalism. What was so important about the Baptists and other sectarians such as the Quakers was the absolute centrality of religious freedom, of the sacredness of individual conscience in matters of religious belief. We generally think of religious freedom as one of the many kinds of freedom, many kinds of human rights, first voiced by the European Enlightenment and echoing around the world ever since. But Georg Jelinek, Max Weber's friend and on these matters his teacher, published a book in 1895 called Die Erklärung der Menschen und Bürgerrechte, translated into English in 1901 as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens, which argued that the ultimate source of all modern notions of human rights is to be found in the radical sects of the Protestant Reformation, particularly the Quakers and Baptists. And Jelinek especially points to Roger Williams. Of this development, Weber writes, quote, thus the consistent sect gives rise to an inalienable personal right of the governed as against any power, whether political, hierocratic, or patriarchal. Such freedom of conscience may be the oldest right of man, as Jelinek has argued convincingly. At any rate, it is the most basic right of man because it comprises all ethically conditioned action and guarantees freedom from compulsion especially from the power of the state. In this sense, the concept was as unknown to antiquity and the Middle Ages as it was to Rousseau. Weber then goes on to say that the other rights of man were later joined to this most basic right. Again, to quote, especially the right to pursue one's own economic interests, which includes the inviolability of individual property, the freedom of contract, and vocational choice. I will have to return to the link to economic freedom, but first I want to talk about the relation between the sectarian notion of the sacredness of conscience and what we mean by multiculturalism today, starting with Roger Williams. It is worth remembering that one of the sources of Williams' problems was his unhappiness with John Winthrop's assertion that the Massachusetts Bay colonists were building a city upon a hill because in William's view, it was somebody else's hill. The hill belonged to the Native Americans. And if the other Puritans were inclined to overlook that, Roger Williams was not. When Williams was banished from Massachusetts Bay in January of, eight, of 1636, he probably would not have survived the winter in Rhode Island without the courtesy of the Indians with whom he had, not surprisingly, an excellent relationship. Of this courtesy, he wrote in his charming doggerel, the courteous pagan shall condemn uncourteous Englishmen who live like foxes, bears, and wolves, or lion in his den. Let none sing blessings to their souls, for that they courteous are. The wild barbarians with no more than nature go so far. If nature's sons, both wild and tame, humane and courteous be, how ill becomes it, sons of God, to want humanity. Williams would have nothing to do with the idea that Europeans were superior to Indians. 
He wrote, quote, nature knows no difference between Europe and Americans, by which he meant Native Americans, in blood, birth, bodies, God having of one blood made all mankind, Acts 17, and all by nature being children of wrath, Ephesians 7. And he admonished his fellow Englishmen, boast not proud English of thy birth and blood, thy brother Indian is by birth as good. Of one blood God made him and thee and all, as wise, as fair, as strong, as personal. By nature wrath's his portion, thine no more, till grace his soul and thine restore, make sure thy second birth, else thou shalt see heaven ope to Indian wild, but shut to thee. We know that the passage of the Virginia Act for Religious Freedom and of the First Amendment of the Constitution, and it was no accident following Yellenek and Weber that it was the First Amendment, of which I will have more to say in a moment, depended on an alliance of Enlightenment deists like Jefferson and Madison and sectarians, largely Baptists. The fundamental Baptist position on the sacredness of conscience relative to government action is brought out in a passage discovered by Martin Lipset in The First New Nation. The idea must seem quaint to us today, but in 1810, Congress passed a law decreeing that mail should be delivered on Sundays. In 1830, a Senate committee reported negatively on a bill to abolish Sunday mail delivery. The report, written by Richard Johnson, a Kentucky senator and an active Baptist layman, argued that laws prohibiting the government from providing service on Sunday would be an injustice to irreligious people or non-Christians and would constitute a special favor to Christians. The report spelled out these principles. The Constitution, Constitution wrote Johnson, regards the conscience of the Jew as sacred as that of the Christian and gives no more authority to adopt a measure affecting the conscience of a solitary individual than that of a whole community. If Congress shall declare the first day of the week holy, it will not satisfy the Jew nor the Sabbatarian. It will dissatisfy both and consequently convert neither. It must be recollected that in the earliest settlement of this country, the spirit of persecution, which drove the pilgrims from their native homes, was brought with them to their new habitations, and that some Christians were scourged and others put to death for no other crime than dissenting from the dogmas of their rulers. Johnson goes on, if a solemn act of legislation shall in one point define God or point out to the citizen one religious duty, it may with equal propriety define every part of divine revelation and enforce every religious obligation even to the forms and ceremonies of worship, the endowment of the church, and the support of the clergy. It is the duty of this government to affirm to all, to Jew or Gentile, pagan or Christian, the protection and advantages of our benignant institutions on Sunday as well as every other day of the week. So much Senator Johnson in 1830. My fellow sociologist of religion, Philip Hammond, has just published a remarkable book with liberty for all religious freedom, freedom of religion in the United States, detailing the vicissitudes of this sectarian Protestant concern for the sacredness of the individual conscience as it got embodied in the First Amendment to the Constitution and has been given ever wider meaning by the judicial system, especially the Supreme Court, ever since. For Hammond, the key move was to extend the sacredness of conscience from religious belief to any seriously held conviction whatever. A key moment in this transformation was the court's decision to extend the right of conscientious objection to military service to those whose beliefs were not in any traditional sense religious, but were fervently held nonetheless. Individual conviction and conscience have become the standards relative to which even long-established practices can be overturned. Hammond argues that Roe v. Wade is an example of the extension of this principle and that its logic will ultimately lead to the legitimation of gay marriage. In the course of the extension of the sacredness of individual conscience from religion to the entire range of belief, Hammond argues, the sacred core of the conscience collective, the very sacred center of our society, what might even be called our civil religion, has moved from the churches to the judiciary. Whether we need to go that far with Hammond could be argued, but he has surely uncovered something very important about our society 
something deeper than utilitarian or expressive individualism, the sacredness of the individual conscience, the individual person. And I might add as an aside that today, in a city like San Francisco, near where I live, where you can probably do almost anything within reason and still not raise an eyebrow, it is all ultimately thanks to the Baptists, <laughs> even though some Baptists today have, have a little problem with that. It is with this background in mind that I think we can understand why multiculturalism as an ideology is so appealing to Americans today, but why the emphasis, emphasis on culture is so misleading. A common culture does not mean that we are all the same. Common cultures are normally riven with argument, controversy, and conflict. Those who imagine that in habits of the heart we were arguing for homogeneous communities, languishing in bland consensus, could hardly have gotten us more wrong. Difference between communities, and we must also remember that there are differences within communities, starting with the family, which someone recently defined as the place we go to fight. Uh, even when the cultural differences between them are remarkably thin, such, as, uh, differences, such differences can give rise to significant differences in identity. Here I want to make a strong distinction between culture and identity. I might point out that the racial conflict that was recently most violent at Berkeley High School and many other California high schools in the last few years was not between Asian Americans and African Americans or whites and Hispanics, but between American-born Hispanics and Hispanic immigrants. The ideology of multiculturalism tells us that their culture is the same. The reality of violence tells us that their identity isn't Identity is not the same thing as culture, but it can be just as important. Remember Bosnia, where Serbs, Croats, and Muslims share a common language and probably 99% of their culture, but where the memory of ancestral religion in a highly secularized society has led to murderous conflicts of quite recently constructed political identities. It's worth pursuing this issue a bit as it is played out in our society. There is a great confusion in both language and thought, which arises when we use culture and identity interchangeably, and sometimes add race to the same explosive mix. I would like to give some examples of current confusions of what I believe should be carefully distinguished. William Finnegan, in a fascinating article of last year, describes the hunger for identity, but the shallowness of cultural resources for it in Antelope Valley, a rather recently developed outer suburb of Los Angeles. For example, he mentions a girl named Mindy who became a Mormon, but before that she had, quote, wanted to become Jewish, but that had turned out to be too much work. Becoming a Mormon was relatively easy. All this was before Mindy got addicted to crystal methamphetamine and became a Nazi in the ninth grade. Finnegan's article, concludes, quoting Martha Wengert, a sociologist at Antelope Valley, this area has grown so fast that neighborhoods are not yet communities. Kids are left with this intense longing for identification. Gangs, race nationalism, and all manner of beliefs arise from this longing. I thought of Debbie Turner's inability to comprehend Mindy's enthusiasm for the likes of Charles Manson and Adolf Hitler. The kids reach out to these historical figures, Dr. Wengert said, but it's through TV, through comic books, through word of mouth. There are no books at home, no ideas, no sense of history. These identities that lack any cultural depth are nonetheless powerful enough to be literally matters of life and death for the young people involved. My point is that though Lindy's identity swung between would-be Jewish to Mormon to Nazi, and that these identities could be very important to her, indeed, indeed to her fate, her culture, in any meaningful sense of the word, was suburban LA. Another example which should just suggest just how confusing these issues can be comes to me from a Chinese-American graduate student in my department at Berkeley. 
This student lives in a housing project in inner city Oakland, partly because he has been a volunteer in the social outreach program of a church nearby. This housing project is largely inhabited by immigrants from Cambodia. He wrote a paper based on his observation of the young people living in the project as part of his orals exams. He found that these young people of Cambodian descent dressed and spoke like African Americans, were quite accomplished in black music and dance, and had in general assimilated into what could locally be called black culture. Since the Oakland School District has a majority of African American students, this was not terribly surprising. What the children of immigrants have always done in America is to assimilate to American culture. And in this case, the available American culture was black. On the other hand, my student found that the attitude of these young people to traditional Cambodian culture was distinctly ambivalent, with a lot of hostility involved. Again, as has often been the case with immigrant children, they had little interest in traditional Cambodian ceremonies, which they didn't understand, having little fluency in the language, and they vigorously resisted some of the assumptions of their elders, for example, that young women should marry early to older men chosen by their parents. Nothing in the culture they were assimilating into would justify that. To add to the complexity, their African-American and white peers referred to these young people as Chinese, based on a superficial judgment of their looks. Now, one thing Cambodians are not is Chinese. Neither in language or culture is there any link to China. Cambodia is an outlying culture fundamentally of Indic origin, not Chinese. Nevertheless, in their distinct minority situation, with gangs often organized along racial lines, these Cambodians youth, Cambodian youths were ready to make alliances with Chinese, American, or any other groups of Asian descent that would add to their own strength. And in so doing, though they could not think of themselves as Chinese, they could think of themselves as Asian American. And finally, the public schools, in an effort to respect cultural diversity, taught that the Cam Cambodian culture which these students were presumed to have had to be respected by others. The confusion of culture, genes, and identity, all of which in fact were varying independently, could hardly be more total. And finally, a personal anecdote. In 1970, at the time of the so-called Third World Strike at Berkeley, where the demands were the establishment of an ethics studies department, I was teaching a course on Japanese society when, near the end of a lecture, some students burst into the back of the classroom and started shouting at me. I recognized the most vocal of them as a graduate student in my own department. He yelled at me, you shouldn't be teaching this course. This is a course in yellow studies, and you should be teaching white studies. He turned to an undergraduate student of obvious Asian extraction sitting in my class and said, he should be teaching this class, not you. I spoke to the undergraduate, who I had no reason to think was Japanese-American, since I knew that there were at least as many Chinese-American students in the class as Japanese-Americans, and I asked him, do you speak Japanese? His answer was no. Do you know Japanese history? Again, no. Do you know Japanese literature? No. So I asked the graduate student, why do you think this student should teach the course? He turned and left the room. He didn't come back either. Now, I am old enough to have lived through World War II. And I learned in those days a good bit about Nazi race theory. And I had just gotten in 1970 a taste of it from this self-styled Berkeley leftist. Unfortunate, fortunately, the term yellow studies never caught on. And this experience has given me an indelible, indelible dislike of the idea of white studies, which I gather as a flickering half-life at present. Let me say parenthetically that the widespread use of the word race in current American discourse is highly problematic. In the popular mind, the term has an inevitable biological meaning. Think of the widespread response to the book, The Bell Curve, which was refuted by everyone in the world and still has its huge sales. Yet as a biological term, race has been completely exploded. Russell Stevens, in a recent review of a book on the African origins of, a, of modern humanity, notes the book's vehement assertion that the classical concept of race in humans is no longer tolerable, and that, to the contrary, the entire species is remarkably alike. 
biologically, I'm sorry, Cornell, race doesn't matter. As a cultural construct, or better yet, as a focus of identity, race does matter. And yes, I know Cornell West isn't speaking biology either. But when you title a book, Race Matters, I think it's perilous. Where such distinctions are not made, the use of the word race can easily become, whether from the right or the left, racist. To make sense of all this and to see how the issues of diversity and identity relate to morality, I would like to turn to one of my few living heroes, Václav Havel. In a speech he gave to the Czech Parliament on December 9th of last year, he said, we often talk about the identity of a state or a nation or a society, and more than one opponent of European integration has ranted on about national identity and tried to engender fear of its loss. Most who speak this way subconsciously understand identity as something predestined, something genetic, almost an identity of blood that is something over which we have no influence or control. The notion of identity, this notion of identity, says Havel, is thoroughly discredited. Identity is, above all, an accomplishment, a particular work, a particular act. Identity is not something separate from responsibility, but on the contrary, is its very expression. I don't think that what Havel's saying is, in any simple sense, an advocacy of what is called social constructivism these days. Havel knows that fate and blood are among the things we have to work with in the act of identity, but they're not the same as identity. Culture, however, which is deeply plural, is not a matter of fate or blood, but our deepest resource for the responsible accomplishment of identity. In other words, in the modern world, Multi multiculturalism is inevitably within each of us, not just between us. What that Berkeley graduate student didn't realize is that in my study of East Asian culture, I had internalized aspects of Confucianism and Mahayana Buddhism, made them part of my identity. It was Jim Be Peacock who, in his review of Habits of the Heart, pointed out that it was a book that could have been written only by someone with a deep exposure to East Asian culture. And he perhaps didn't realize that one of my co-authors, Richard Madsen, was a longtime China specialist. Although Bella is a Scottish name, and I was raised in the Presbyterian Church, my deepest identity as a Christian came not from genes or upbringing, but from a long struggle as an adult to understand what Christianity could possibly mean in today's world, something my early Sunday school experiences didn't give me much help with. To let one's identity be decided by alleged friends or alleged foes, though that is hard to resist in situations of internecine conflict like Bosnia, is finally morally irresponsible. In America, to let one's identity be decided by being placed in one of five and only five boxes is irresponsible indeed. That is to turn multiculturalism into something that is finally not cultural at all but a pure form of identity politics. And yet in America, the rise of identity politics on a local or national scale probably signals something else, something much closer to the core of what I am arguing is the real common culture. And here again, I turn to Anthony Appia. If we explore, he wrote, these moments of tension between groups in contemporary America, we discover an interesting paradox. The growing salience of race and gender as social irritants, which may seem to reflect the call of collective identities, is a reflection as much as anything else of the individual's concern for dignity and respect. As our society slouches on toward a fuller realization of its ideal of, cultural equal of social equality, everyone wants to be taken seriously, to be respected, not dissed, because on many occasions disrespect still flows from racism, sexism, and homophobia, we respond in the name of all black people, all women, all gays, as the case may be. But the truth is that what mostly irritates us in, this moments, in, the, in these moments is that we 
as individuals feel diminished. And the trouble with appeal to cultural differences is that it obscures rather than diminishes this situation. It is not black culture that the racist disdains, but blacks. There is no conflict of visions between black and white cultures that is the source of racial discord. No amount of knowledge of the architectural achievements of Nubia or Kush guarantees respect for African Americans. No African American is entitled to greater concern because he is descended from a people who created jazz or produced Toni Morrison. Culture is not the problem, and culture is not the solution. If the problem is disrespect for the dignity of the person, then the solution is to go back to that deepest core of our tradition, the sacredness of the conscience and person of every individual. And that is what a great deal of the ideology of multi multiculturalism really boils down to. We're all different, we're all unique, respect that. But there is another problem, a very big problem and its solution is hard to envisage. Just when we are moving to an ever greater validation of the sacredness of the individual person, our capacity to imagine a social fabric that would hold individuals together is vanishing. This is in part because of the fact that the religious individualism that I've been describing is linked to an economic individualism which ironically knows nothing of the sacredness of the individual. Its only standard is money, and the only thing more sacred than money is more money. What economic individualism destroys, and what our kind of religious individualism cannot restore, is solidarity, a sense of being members of the same body. In most other North Atlantic societies, a tradition of an established church, however secularized, provides some notion that we are in this thing together, that we need each other, that our precious and unique selves aren't going to make it all alone. This is a tradition singularly weak in our country, though Catholics and some high church Protestants have tried to provide it. The trouble is, as Chesterton put it, in America, even the Catholics are Protestants. And we also lack a tradition of social democracy such as most European nations possess, not unrelated to the established church traditions in which there is some notion of a government that bears responsibility for its people. But here it was not Washington and Hamilton who won, but Jefferson and Madison with their rabid hatred of the state who carried the day. Roger Williams was a moral genius, but he was a sociological catastrophe. After he founded the First Baptist Church, he left it for a smaller and purer one. That too he found inadequate. So he founded a church that consisted only of himself, his wife, and one other person. One wonders how he stood even those two. And Williams, who could have converted the Indians, didn't, because he said, what could I convert them to? There's no true church. Since Williams ignored secular society, money took over in Rhode Island in a way that would not be true for a long time in Massachusetts or Connecticut. Rhode Island under Williams gives us an early and local example of what happens when the sacredness of the individual is not balanced by any sense of the whole or concern for the common good. In the Habits of the Heart, we spoke of the second languages that must complement our language of individualism if we are not to slip into total incoherence. I was not very optimistic then. I'm even less so today. Almost the only time this society has ever gotten itself together has been in time of war. And I'm sure that my understanding of America is deeply formed by experiencing the Depression as a child and the Second World War as an adolescent. It is not easy to hear those second languages today, and some of those who are too young to have shared my experiences seem hardly able to recognize them even when they hear them. But the poignant reality is that without a minimal degree of solidarity, the project of ever greater recognition of individual dignity will collapse in on itself. Under the ideological facade of individual freedom, the reality will be, is already becoming, a society in which wealth 
ever more concentrated in a small minority is the only access to real freedom, the market will determine the lives of everyone else. So much as we owe the Baptists, and I would be the first to affirm it, we cannot look to them for a way out. All you have to do is look at the two Baptists in the White House to see that. And yes, I know Hillary is a Methodist. I meant Clinton and Gore. But if I can pull myself back from the abyss, which sometimes in my Jeremiah mood is almost the only thing I can see, I can describe even now resources and possibilities for a different outcome than the one toward which we seem to be heading. By the time we came to publish the 1996 edition of Habits of the Heart, we realized that even the biblical and civic republican traditions, which we had called second languages, had made their own contributions to the kind of individualism that we had largely blamed on utilitarianism and expressivism in the first edition. This does not mean, however, that the second languages haven't still much to teach us, even if what we have to learn from them must pass through the fires of self-criticism from within these traditions themselves. Our situation is curiously similar to that of post-communist Europe, Eastern Europe, in at least one respect. Vaclav Havel and others have opposed an effort to distinguish too sharply between the guilty and the innocent in the former communist regime, regimes, since it was the very nature of those regimes to draw almost everyone into some kind of complicity. The line between guilt and innocence ran through rather than between individuals, it was argued. I think of the banner in an East German church shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall which read, we are Cain and Abel. With respect to our American individualism, even in its most destructive forms, it is useless to try to sort out the good guys from the bad guys. We are all complicit, yet change is never impossible. And the deepest resource for change is the genuine diversity in the world's cultures, available to us as never before in human history, not the ideology of multiculturalism, which turns out to be only one more version of American individualism. So let me sum up my argument. There is indeed a common culture in America. It is a common culture dominated by the market and the state and disseminated through the mass media, the laws, and public education. I'm not here to celebrate that common culture. I have spent my life criticizing it. But I have argued that beneath the surface glitter of American culture, which by the way is having an impact on everywhere in the world, everywhere, I don't know a society where people aren't worried that they aren't turning into Americans. Uh, just think of the enormous numbers of people that are going to see Titanic all over the world. Give me a break. <laughs> but beneath all that, there is a deep inner core. And this also is enormously appealing to the world, which I have argued is ultimately religious the sacredness of the conscience of every single individual. Even toward that, I am very ambivalent. It is responsible for the best in our culture, but by the very weakness of any idea of human solidarity associated with it, it opens the door to the worst in our culture. Because there is a Christian core to our culture, and even a core that derives from a type of Christianity, for which my friend Stanley Hauerwas has a special sympathy, I cannot agree with him that Christians in America can be or ought to be resident aliens. How can we be resident aliens in a culture we, have so, we are so largely responsible for creating? And wouldn't the effort to be resident aliens only leave the larger society to its own worst devices? Rather, I believe Christians must take the responsibility of radical citizenship in the effort to save our culture from its excesses and to reconstruct forms of social solidarity that are currently so gravely weakened. Conversely, I would argue for a considerable moderation of the language of multiculturalism, and that for several reasons. But above all, because it makes us think we are more diverse than we really are. The negative consequences of this false consciousness are evident to me on both the left and the right. On the left, it weakens the critique of our common culture by blaming its defects on one particular group rather than facing how pervasive it is in all groups. To the extent that it exacerbates identity politics, it diverts attention from the reform of American society to the competitive struggle to see which middle class groups will get the goodies. 
It effectively abandons the truly deprived who are unable to enter the struggle of identity of politics in the first place. On the right, the consequences are even worse. By repeating the mantra, we're all so different, we're all so diverse, how can you expect this society to do anything effective? And how often have we heard this mantra? It essentially abandons the effort to face our problems together. It effectively obscures the deepest divide in our society, the divide of class, the widening gap between wealth and poverty. It is one of the oldest stories in American history that it leaves the less privileged members of our society to squabble among themselves over issues of diversity and multiculturalism rather than to unite in the demand for a greater realization of social justice. So where does that leave us? Here I'd like to return to the reference to nuances and inflections in our common culture that I made early in this paper. Recognizing that we are all of whatever race and gender tempted to exalt our own imperial egos above all else, we can still find those social contexts and those traditions of interpretation which can moderate that egoism and offer a different understanding of personal fulfillment. Every church and synagogue that reminds us that it is through love of God and neighbor that we will find ourselves helps to mitigate our isolation. Every time we engage in activities that help to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give shelter to the homeless, we are becoming more connected to the world. Every time we act politically to keep the profit principle out of spheres where it ought not to set the norms of action, we help to preserve what Jürgen Habermas calls the life world. And incidentally, prevent the market from destroying the moral foundations upon which the market itself, itself is made possible. It must be obvious from the example of recent history that without the legal and ethical culture of public morality, a market economy turns into mafia gangsterism. We still have more of what has come to be called social capital than many other nations, but it cannot be taken for granted. It survives only when we in our religious and civic groups work strenuously to conserve and increase it. Thus, I still believe that there are places in the churches and other religious and civic organizations and even nooks and crannies in the universities to which we might look. But the hour is late and the problems mount. In this hour of need in our strange republic, it is up to us to teach the truth as we discern it, which is what I have tempted attempted to do here tonight. Thank you. I told Stanley at dinner, I didn't know when I first accepted this invitation that it was going to be Tuesday of Holy Week, but I gave you a penitential sermon, so <clears throat> I would be ready to receive questions, challenges, refutations, yes. Well, I should ask the anthropologist present to do that for me. Uh, it is a very big question. I guess, let me use a metaphor. By culture, I mean something thick, something that goes all the way down. It's basically formative of uh, our understanding of self and world. Identity is often extremely thin and extremely fragile. It can change abruptly, as in this LA suburban young woman that I uh, mentioned. Um, and I think if you want to look at percentages, all Americans who aren't first generation share far more than they don't share. 
in that sense, we have an extraordinarily homogeneous culture in this, in this society. It's not Ghana. It's not even Belgium, where the Flemish and the French have really separate cultures. Um, and therefore, my problem is multiculturalism as an ideology leads us to think we're all so different. And I would say, just below the level of identity politics, we're not different very much at all. That's my basic argument. Yes, Elizabeth. You spoke about the uh, third kind of individualism, and I wonder where you see the roots of the solidarity. Yeah, good question. It's very hard to see. Um, I mean, it's part of being a frontier culture. It's part, I mean, I, I just recently read a fascinating book by. Uh, Emory University primatologist, Franz de Waal. Um, solidarity is inversely related to the capacity to leave the group you're in. America has always prided itself on being the place you could leave. Goodbye, so long. Marriage, anything else, you know, church, whatever. Uh, that's very tough. Societies that have to live cheek by jowl, like the Japanese or the Javanese or the Dutch or the Belgians, have more going with solidarity than we do. On the other hand, this isn't a, this isn't a frontier culture anymore. Our realistic interdependence is enormous. Um, you can't just go off and start your own homestead and forget about everyone else. I mean, this isn't the 1830s. And uh, we haven't waked up to a reality which requires a degree of solidarity which our cultural resources are not very good at providing. So, I mean, in Habits, we talked about biblical and republican sources. I'm trying to suggest tonight even those are tainted. But I think that's the place to start, to struggle with those, to recover something that could help us meet our, meet our needs. The most depressing single thing about American history is that the only time a society has ever really been solidary is during war. And who could wish that? I mean, God knows we don't wish that. Even the idiotic solidarity during the Gulf War, um, the yellow ribbons and so on that lasted about one month, I mean, that was so brief and so few, few people were killed that it couldn't even re-elect the president of, who presided over that war, which is unheard of in American history. So that's the bad news. And I don't know where to look for the good news except to say that there obviously are resources here and maybe we have to look at other cultures. America is not a self-sufficient society. We think we are, but we're not. Maybe we have to learn from other cultures that have done it better than we have. If you look at the way we've handled the problems of poverty in this society, we are the worst, the absolute worst and getting worse. There's no advanced industrial society in the world that couldn't teach us to do something better about poverty than we're doing in this society. What exactly what what have we had since sixty? Yes. 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 Well, I wish. I wish. I mean, I had a very interesting discussion with two or three kids in my senior seminar a year ago at Berkeley who had actually grown up in Mexico, where 
they spoke of relatives and neighbors coming in and out of houses. And all three of them said, even though we have cousins and we have aunts and uncles in the Bay Area, we never see each other. They're not bringing that culture to America. The power of the dominant culture is just debilitating whatever they might have had of a more solidary kind of culture. To, to me, at the moment, the most powerful factor in American culture is the market. And not just because of the economics of it, but because the culture of it. We are being sold the notion that the market will solve all problems in every sphere. I mean, and, and social science is being colonized with rational choice theory, which is basically economics applied to human beings. Um, this is our biggest challenge, I think. And I don't see any immigrant group has been able to, to stand up against it. Neither Asian nor Hispanic nor any other immigrant group, as I see it in California, is really able to resist this. Yes. Well, read Habits of the Heart. I mean, we do, we're not quite as gloomy as I am tonight. Um, there are resources in our tradition and that to have, have some degree of life today. Um, as I mentioned at the very last paragraph of my talk, in the churches, in civic groups. Um, but these are all under, undermined by the present mood of the society. I mean, there are moments when I even think what this society needs is a good resounding depression. Then we'd know we need each other. As long as we're in the illusion that we're in this marvelous economic, and what is it, the long boom wired magazine, 25 years it's gonna just, the Dow is gonna go to 25,000. Tell me about it, yeah, sure. Uh, perhaps as long as the society lives in this dream world, and Titanic makes two billion dollars, we're not going to face the world. But the history of capitalism teaches me that you never have a boom without a bust. And the next bust, when we have totally dismantled our safety net, is going to create problems that maybe will finally wake up people to see that this society is in real, real trouble. But as long as we can somehow just whistle our way through, uh, we're not facing that, that reality yet. Yes. Well, it's, it seems to me that just to keep keeping the debate alive and raising the questions about our common culture um, is terribly important. And the university is one of the few places where that happens. Um, it's not easy in the university either. Um, I, 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 I'll just give me a little example of how university culture is not necessarily congenial to a public conversation about our common problems. In Berkeley, all departments, this is probably true in any major research university, are reviewed by an outside review committee, usually about every five years. And the last time we were reviewed, which was about three or four years ago, the review committee, which was mainly other people at Berkeley in adjacent departments, but some people from Stanford, thanks a lot, um, <laughs> reviewed my department and said we were weak on formalization, mathematization, and computerization. Um, we have our positivists, as every good department does. Uh, 
We have in the national ratings, we're number two. I mean, we're not exactly down there. Uh, apparently, some people think that Berkeley's okay. But what struck me was not what they thought was lacking, which was the sheer idiocy of over-specialization that's so common in the university, but that they did not even mention the fact that six or eight members of our department had written books that created public discussion beyond the closed world of sociology as a profession. But Arlie Hochschild, whose uh, second shift and whose time bind have had huge response. Uh, Todd Gidlin's work, of course, two of the authors of Habits are there. This was not considered worth even a comment. So I would say the reward systems of the university do not favor public discussion, and yet, there are those of us who insist on engaging in it. Now, obviously, the Keenan lectureship and all the things you do here are ways of institutionalizing that and against the grain, in a sense, of an over-specialized academia that, where work is produced only for fellow specialists and where promotions are based on the number of articles in so-called reviewed journals. Uh, of the two reviewed journals in my profession, there was a poll a few years ago uh, which found that over 50% of sociologists said they never read the American Sociological Review because they couldn't understand the articles in it. So you get tenure for writing articles in a magazine that even your own profession doesn't understand, much less the general public. Well, don't get me started on that. But, but obviously, there are places where this is resisted and where we can one of the few places where we can continue a public debate on these issues. So I treasure that possibility. It's there in Berkeley, it's obviously there at Duke. And, and you know, often I find in, in liberal arts colleges there's a genuine culture of, of public discussion, more than in a research university. So I'm not by any means too depressed about, about uh, the university as a possible uh, locus of public discussion. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know. I can't comment. Okay. Jim. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that, that, that globalism is the latest buzzword, and most of the rest of the world sees globalism talk as Americanization. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the way, I mean, we explain everything we're doing, and it's horrible because the global market requires it. And uh, that becomes a kind of higher level reference beyond any culture or any place or whatsoever. Um, to the degree that that way of thinking is stronger in this country and that we actually, in a quasi-imperialist way, are imposing it on the rest of the world. I mean, I'm very, very ambivalent about the American reaction to the Asian financial crisis, which is, why aren't you more like us, and so on. Um, now, we don't think of that as Americanization because the market is this holy grail, it sits out there, it's pristine, it's nature, pure nature. But I think, I think that's an illusion. And it's again, it's a symptom of our sickness, of our lack of a sense of concrete place, that we have an ideology which is rootless as our, perhaps our dominant ideology at the moment. 
Oh, up here. Yes, great. Yes. Well, I'm very ambivalent about that, too, among the many things I'm ambivalent about. Um, volunteerism is a marvelous way that Americans have of avoiding the hard problems. As we pointed out in Habits, volunteering is easy. It's face-to-face. -face. People don't find it psychologically intimidating. They actually get a lot of rewards from it. Um, Robert Westno published a book whose title escapes me at the moment, On American Volunteerism, in which he found that the motivation of many people involved in volunteer activities was that it made them feel good. And, and Wethno made the point that, OK, well, what if it doesn't make them feel good? Then what? Um, volunteerism, so long as it is a resource for a broader understanding of social solidarity, and in particular, as long as it plays into a notion of citizenship, can be very positive. But where it is actually a substitute for citizenship, where it actually is used to excuse non-engagement with politics, then I think it actually undermines solidarity, even though at the face-to-face -face level it seems to be enhancing it. That's my problem. Yes. Um, I have a question. The man who asked about the universities, I guess you took a different take on it than I was thinking you would answer. And not in terms of academia, but in terms of student bodies. Um, a lot of students of ethnic descent or immigrant backgrounds, like my parents are immigrants. Um, when, you, when they come to the university, they rediscover their culture. They take classes in the language they were supposed to have known, I guess, that their parents spoke. They learn about the history of the, of the countries that their parents come from. They learn about identity in America. Um, like most students in African American studies are often African American. Most students in Hindi class, especially this school, are. Indian descent. Um, uh, personally, I feel that that sort of rediscovery integrates my conception of this mass American monoculture with this idea of like the um, ethnic culture from which I'm derived. I'm wondering what you think about that whole process that, uh, that happens to minority students in higher education. Do you feel it destructive toward the American identity, or is it destructive, or how does it fit in? It's it's very much part of it as far as I can see. It's only a more recent extension of the denominational pattern that you discovered who you were through a group that had some relation to where your family came from. And in early American, earlier American history, before we had departments of ethnic studies and so on, people did that very largely through religious groups. Um, uh, in, in the beginning, Polish and Italian Americans, for instance, who were not religious in their homelands, uh, became active in Catholic parishes that were Polish or Italian. And that gave them a sense of solidarity and pride. The, the main function of that, however, turned out to be the assimilation of them into general American culture. Uh, and my sense is that that's really what's going on now with what you're talking about. That everybody in America has to have some particular identity. But where it's something you learn in college or you learn as an adult, it's important, but it's hardly, so, it's hardly deeply defining. Um, I recently had an interesting discussion of this with uh, some colleagues who are Jewish who pointed out that Many secular Jews of my generation are surprised to discover their children going to synagogue. And the explanation was, for Jews of my generation, there still was an ethnic culture. There was food, there was Yiddish, there was a left-wing politics, a whole lot of identity elements. 
Now you've got Irving Kristol being the leading neoconservative. I mean, where is that culture? Everybody speaks a little Yiddish. I mean, it's not there. Everybody eats bagels, so what? So, so they, go to, they go to synagogue, the kids. They don't learn the violin anymore. They, they're paying, playing baseball, they're being the cheerleaders. So yes, they have a Jewish identity, but the cultural content is almost completely gone. And, and my sense is that much of what goes on in multiculturalism today is primarily a way of assimilating people into middle-class America with a little uh, whipped cream on top of, of ethnic diver diversity or racial diversity. But the basic message is how to make it in this society as a competitive and middle-class person. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did talk about this in both habits in the good society. Uh, but it's long ago and far away when there was any principled challenge to the dominance of the market principle. How we're going to do that today. And, and I, I really do think that there have been two great totalitarianisms in the 20th century. And one was state totalitarianism and the other is market totalitarianism. We've dismantled state totalitarianism, and now we're seeing the full fury of market totalitarianism. And I don't think people can live in that kind of society. I don't think it's, it's human. I don't think people can, in the long run, live in a society where their entire lives are determined by market forces. But at the moment, it's very hard to see where a serious critique of that will come from. And as I rather painfully suggested earlier, maybe only when the market begins to show its usual tendency to collapse when we begin to get a serious counter movement and a serious critique. Well, thank you very much.